Good day, folks. Good to be here with you once again. Thank you for having me in your places and spaces and all those funny words. I really appreciate your time and attention and as much as you can uh, put up with me, I really appreciate that as well. I just want to begin our time with a question. Are you living a wise life? Are you living a wise life? Now you might say, Pastor, what do you mean? Are, are you talking about like making wise decisions about things like relationships or, or money or other things? What do you mean by living a wise life? Well, let me give you an answer from the life of Moses. Not Grandma Moses. Yes, the Moses of the Red Sea Crossing. Yes, the Moses of the Ten Commandments. Moses once prayed to God and said, Teach us to number our days that we get a heart of wisdom. So what was Moses getting at here? We know that Moses had begun his prayer by acknowledging that God had always been a refuge for every person that has and will be born from the very beginning of human history. He uses the term all generations. We also know that Moses prayed that God is everlasting, that he is eternal, that God was before anything, was and will be when it all comes to an end. Moses also prayed to God because it is God who returns man to dust. That the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. They are gone, are soon gone and we fly away. Now John Bloom, who is a staff writer for DesiringGod.org, recommends his readers to memorize Moses' prayer. After all, it is recorded for us, if we so choose, it's Psalm 90. Why? Why should we commit Psalm 90 to memory? Well, Bloom reasons and writes this, quote, This prayer of Moses will help you keep your life, your real life, your really short life, in perspective. And I think Bloom's point is worthy of consideration. After all, Broom, 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 pardon me, Bloom goes on to remind his readers, quote, are you spending your short life on what really matters? Life is too short to waste. Live wise. So are, are we living a wise life? And maybe another question is, how do we live a wise life? Well, before we look at text, I want to just mention uh, the Apostle Paul, who will point us in the right direction, get us moving along. And just like Moses, just like Moses, Paul would often pray, and one of these prayers here is one of his prayers to record for us in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul prayed, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And we can just say amen to that. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. And we will be uh, looking at verse 97 to 104. And by the way, just so you know, for something to know, after we're done this uh, stanza, we will have completed approximately 59% of Psalm 119. Not a, bad, not a bad mark, quite frankly. Okay, Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Bless the reading of your word, Lord. Let us pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who are watching or listening uh, to this particular message. Thank you for whoever else is listening. Help us to Understand what this stanza, this text is uh, uh, teaching us today, O Holy Spirit, the living God. And not only give us ears to hear, but hearts to understand and minds to learn and hands and feet to uh, carry out the, the commandments that you give us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the psalmist began, the psalmist began uh, by stating in verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And moving from this statement to the eight verses that make up this stanza, we find uh, the psalmist incorporated seven words he used for law. In other words, seven synonyms. Uh, so we ask the question then, uh, what is the subject? of these eight verses. What is the subject? Oh, quite frankly, we can see it quite clearly. I hope you can too. It is the Word of God. And then this brings up another question. What was a psalmist's relationship between the Word of God and the psalmist? I kind of jumped ahead of myself there. But this, this question has a broader uh, implication because it's a question that we should answer ourselves. What is the relationship between the Word of God and the people of God today. And let's bring this closer to home. What is the relationship between the Word of God and you? The Word of God and myself? Well, as we move along in the text, we, we look at this from a bird's eye view. We notice that this is the first time that the psalmist in his prayer does not ask God for anything. We move up a few verses earlier. The psalmist prayed and asked uh, in verse 94, Save me. Why did he pray this? Well, he goes on to explain that the wicked lie in wait to destroy me, verse 95. And we see this kind of petition uh, from the psalmist from verse 1, 1 through to 96, but not here in these eight verses. For what we find here in this context is a psalmist, the psalmist's prayer is in the context of a testimony and praise to the Lord. And of course, this brings us back to the subject of this stanza, the Word of God. And when we think of our own context, our own day and age, the 21st century, we've got to remember that when we talk about the Word of God, we are talking about the 66 books of the Bible, from Genesis all the way through to the end of Revelation. Of course, the psalmist would have been appealing here to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and this should never, ever create any apprehension in us today. For God's revelation of himself, his sovereign purposes, which includes the working out of his redemptive purposes throughout a human history, is all there for us to see in the very first 11 chapters of Genesis. And the rest of history, or we could say the rest of his story, would continue as God, by his Holy Spirit, would inspire 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years to write the Bible that we have in our hands today. And here's the point. The psalmist in our text expressed as the Holy Spirit inspired him to, uh, to show how practical and valuable the Word of God is for the people of God. How practical and valuable that this Word is for his people. So the subject remains. The Word of God and what it does for the people of God. And we see this through the lens and the context and the experience of the psalmist of Psalm 119. But with the help of the message of Psalm, Songs for the People of God, uh, which is a commentary, we have here in the text five things that the Word of God does for the people of God. So we begin with where the psalmist began here in verse 97 with the statement, Oh, how I love your law. This phrase, I love, that the ESV has translated from the Hebrew we have the sense here of one is uh, the sense here is of one who has a great affection and loyalty toward the law. We have seen how the psalmist, uh, right from the beginning, has trusted God to keep his promises. Now we see here that the promises of God and the law, that is the word of God, are for the psalmist sweet as honey. Uh, verse 103, the psalmist said, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. King David said this of the law, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. We find that in Psalm 19, verse 7. And then in verse 10, uh, King David would say, Sweeter also than honey. So the first of the five things that the Word of God does for the people of God is that it delights them. It delights them. Now I want to bring it back to you. What do you delight in? Where and who are you putting your trust and faith in today? You know, we began with a good question from Bloom. 
Are you spending your short life on what really matters? When we began our study of Psalm 119, we discovered a real person in real history who in the midst of his trials and tribulations would go on to say, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. That's verse 16, way back there where we, when we started. Who would also go on to say, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. life. Verse 92 and 93. So what do you delight in? And where and who are you putting your faith and trust in today? Well, next, folks, uh, the Word of God accompanies the people of God. The Word of God accompanies the people of God continually. We see here the psalmist in the second half of verse 97, we'll call that 97b, and, and verse 98 said, It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment make me, makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. We go to another person uh, many years after the psalmist, the Apostle Paul, and we see there in his second letter to Timothy, he is encouraging and exhorting Timothy to what? To continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. These sacred, write, sacred writings obviously are the Word of God. So Timothy had the Word of God as his companion from the days of his childhood. The Word of God was more than able to make Timothy wise unto salvation in Christ. So I have to ask you this question. Or I don't have to, I want to. How do you navigate the waters of our 21st century culture here in our time? How, let me be specific. What do you feed your mind, your heart, and spirit on? What images come in through the eye gate and saturate uh, your mind? What sounds fill your ears and uh, consume your heart? What thoughts or attitudes, ideas, values, philosophies, cultural influences, etc., etc., mold and shape your spirit? The psalmist said that the word of God was my meditation all the day. That the commandment had made him wiser than his enemies. That the word of God was ever with him. So how do you suppose this came about? Short answer, he would need to know it. How do you suppose he's able to say, I love your law? Short answer again. He had to think about it. He had to saturate his mind, his heart and spirit with the word of God. You see, my friends, the word of God accompanies the people of God. What do you feed your mind, heart and spirit on? Whatever that is will be your companion. Thirdly, the word of God equips the people of God equips the people of God. It was the word of God that had made the psalmist wiser than his enemies. Verse 98. The word of God had given the psalmist more understanding than all of his teachers. The word of God had even given the psalmist understanding that surpassed that of the aged. Verse 100. Aged. Aged. In other words, understanding that surpassed the elders who influenced his contacts in his time. How did this come about for the psalmist? Short answer again. Psalmist said, for I keep your precepts. Verse 100b. Barna.org, back in May of 2019, released their findings on the state of the Bible in the U.S. We don't have time to do a deep dive, obviously. But it was more encouraging uh, as I read through the material than I first thought it would be. But here's something for you to ponder. If someone did a survey of the state of the Bible in your life, what might be the results of their research? Would it reveal that you're one in six who read their Bibles most days during the week? Or maybe you find yourself in the 34 percentile who read their Bibles once a week or more. Uh, what would the research uncover in regards to your beliefs about the Bible? Is the Bible inspired and infallible in all of its content? 
Or is the Bible just another book or maybe somewhere in between these two? For our psalmist, the word of God equipped him for life, equipped him for the good and the bad and ugly. For he said, for it is ever with me. Verse 98b. The fourth thing that the word of God does for God's people, it directs them. It directs them. This is pondering this. It came to mind the current Christian culture that we have in, in North America. I'm, I'm thinking of North America, but I'm sure it's elsewhere. Because one of the fastest growing movements over the past 25, 30 years uh, has been called, in the Western Church today, has been called the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR, or NAR for short. Of course, time is not our friends today, but a quick summary of, of the error and heresy that this movement has committed and continues to promote goes like this. At the NAR's core theological identity, the leaders and people in this movement would say that signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit are everyday occurrences. Sometimes it's like every hour, it seems. The restoring of the authority of the apostles over the worldwide church, uh, the authority of the apostles over the worldwide church, who declare new revelation directly from God, some even saying they're taking trips to heaven on a regular basis, slaying of demons. These are the kinds of things that pretty much describe where this movement departs from the authority of the Word of God. All of these things can be found in the Bible for sure, but it takes some serious, serious misunderstanding or self-deception and abuse of the Holy Spirit as revealed in the Word of God and misuse of the Bible itself to support NAR theology. My friends, the Word of God does direct the people of God. And how does it do this? It directs people of God in the power of the Holy Spirit to obedience of the commands of God as revealed in the Word of God. You might say, how, you ask. Verse 104, the psalmist said, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We can see this unfolding in a very useful and practical way, where the psalmist said back in verse 101, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. In order to keep your word. The psalmist's obedience to the word of God kept him from every false way. Because, my friends, the false path is not simply the wrong path, it is the evil way, as the psalmist describes it in verse 101. So what path are, are you on today? You see, the Word of God directs the people of God to obedience. My mom uh, would, from time to time, challenge me in my faith when she would say to me, Tony, do you love God? And I would respond, you know I do, Mom. And then she would say back to me, then obey him. Well, friends, last but not least, the word of God puts the people of God in touch with God himself. Puts the people of God in touch with God himself. I'm not sure if someone's ever come along and told you that they don't worship the Bible. This is a common statement that I found among many of the hyper-charismatics uh, that I've been taking notice of. It's not always, always with them as well but it's predominantly in some places there. And of course, not all who are call themselves charismatic or Pentecostals uh, do this sort of thing. But certainly in those circles, there are some who would argue that those who esteem the Bible are in some ways worshiping the Bible. And the question is why? Well, because experience has become the most important thing rather than using your mind. More important than the hard work of studying and reading the Bible, which takes effort and work and discipline. The hard work of growing in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ by immersing oneself in the Word of God prayerful, prayerfully. After all, in this new dispensation that we have, God is bringing new revelation directly to his new apostles. All the very time, we apparently have revivals popping up all over the place. We have demonstration of the power of God to heal, for example. And it's kind of silly when you see that, that this is usually just growing a leg an inch. There's not too many of these folks going into hospitals curing, cur uh, you know, healing people of their cancer or other things. Which really indicates to me some fallacy there. And saying things about the Holy Trinity, you know, this is the one that really gets me going. About God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are not found 
on the single page of the Bible, and often their name is dragged in the mud, and, and unbelievers laugh at all this sort of stuff, and, and it's, just, it's just really awful. But if there is some chance, a connection to the Bible is often taken out of context and misapplied. And we see the fruit of this so-called um, a new move of God all over the place. We see self-deception and we see uh, many who are, are dis- deconstructing. That's a term that's being used lately, deconstruction from their faith. I mean, it's, uh, if, if the prophet uh, is, isn't wrong, if the word of God isn't wrong, and I don't see none of this happening in my life, then I mustn't be a Christian or, or I, I just can't do this anymore. It's all about the law when it comes to these folks. It's all law, no grace, even though they talk about grace all the time. And then we see the, the fallout of the leaders, you know, these leaders falling from grace, left and right, caught up, caught up in their sexual idolatry or greed. We also see people actually lo- losing their lives in extreme cases after their so-called self proclaimed prophets and apostles had them drink the poisoned uh, teaching that, they, that they, they teach them. It's really, really sad. But you know, friends, we have spent plenty of time with the psalmist over these past few months, and we can say with a really huge emphasis that the psalmist was never in danger of worshipping the Bible. Pretty much all that he has said up to this point uh, from verse 1 has been spoken directly to God. One commentary points out that, that out of the 176 verses of Psalm 119, 172 are spoken directly to God. You see, the psalmist was not, not under any, the psalmist was under no illusion, I should say, all that the psalmist had learned about God from the law, all that the psalmist had learned, he had learned directly from God, who was his teacher. God had been teaching the psalmist, and that's quite amazing to me and quite marvelous. Now, we were challenged at the beginning of our time today to live wise, to live wise. John Bloom shares of a time while visiting his parents, he found a case containing old reading cards that his grandfather had given to his grandmother over 80 years ago. Cards had been uh, carefully preserved because they had expressed a love at the time that was very significant to his grandparents. Bloom goes on to explain that very few are left in his family that personally witnessed what his grandparents shared over 60 years of marriage. And time would come when his grandparents' love for each other would pass beyond living memory. Then he goes on to say, quote, we suffer from time confusion. We know that our lives are short, yet we, are, we all find this hard to actually believe, believe. Bloom calls this spiritual dissonance. And we see this, that the Word of God teaches us that we have both transcendency, <laughs> finiteness, remember our time with that word, and eternality at work in us. Bloom also identifies that we suffer what, he, what we call, what he calls, Significance confusion. Significance confusion. That is, we know that our lives are significant because God has made us and he does so after his likeness, as Genesis explains. However, our sinful pride causes us to measure our significance not as God designed us, but by seeking after admiration from others. Our sinful natures crave attention and reverence from others instead of humbly finding satisfaction in the knowledge that God has made us in his image. And Bloom summarizes, quote, fallen humans badly want to live self-sufficient and self-determining. We want to live long and live strong, but the belief that we can really do that is a delusion. And his recommendation, we already heard, was memorize Moses' prayer, Psalm 90. I think this was a recommendation that uh, the psalmist would give high fives for. Because, folks, the Word of God delights, accompanies, equips, directs, and puts us in touch with God himself. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for this, and we just let it rest in our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit of the living God, lead us in the way we should go. Uh, Mold us and shape us to become more like your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. Amen. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.